Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at our media briefing this Monday. I'd like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, our medical, medical officer of health, and Paul Johnson, the city's emergency operations center EOC director. And as you heard from the province last week, we re remain under a province-wide state of emergency and stay-at-home order until at least June the 2nd. Uh, good news, uh, in alignment with the provincial direction uh, directive, effective Tuesday, May 18th, 2021, or tomorrow, 8 a.m., those residents in Hamilton who are 18 years of age and older in 2021 are eligible to book an appointment to receive a COVID-19 vaccination. With this change in eligibility, all adults who would like a COVID-19 vaccination are eligible to book an appointment for all. So to book an appointment, members of the public can access the provincial online booking portal found at www.hamilton.ca vaccine booking by calling the uh, provincial hotline as well at 1-888-999-6488. And for those who do not have access to the internet or computer or do not have a valid Ontario photo health card, please call the Public Health Services COVID-19 hotline at 905-905. 974-9848, option seven to book an appointment. Uh, due to potential call volumes expected at the call center, if you are able, we encourage everyone to register online through the provincial portal. This is the quickest process to get an appointment. The hotline is trying to focus on those with health cards or those, those without health cards or those without computer access. So these are all by appointments only clinics and walk-ins are not permitted. And even though uh, we're making the bookings, uh, the, we, we need the vaccine to ensure that uh, we can fulfill those bookings. So uh, we anticipate and hope that additional vaccine supply will come so that we're able to provide that vaccine to everyone that would like to get one. Uh, getting the, the vaccine when you're eligible and adhering to the public health restrictions we have in place continue to be required to help reduce the spread of the virus. So thank you to everyone who continues to do your part by following our public health measures. You are making a difference. I would like to take this opportunity today to acknowledge and thank all of our city staff across our corporation who are working hard to respond to the pandemic as well as working within the confines of the pandemic to ensure the ongoing delivery of city services safely and effectively. Your efforts are very much appreciated. I'd also like to thank our public health leadership and public health staff for their ongoing effort to get vaccines into arms of individuals. You can only, you can't imagine how complicated and difficult it is to try and satisfy all the pressures in terms of who gets the vaccines and when and priority groups and hotspots and all the other variables that come into providing this vaccine, it is not a simple matter, and setting up a clinic is not a simple matter either. So thank you to all of our public health leadership and public health staff for the great work they're doing. Uh, they have my full confidence and support, and I really appreciate the effort that uh, got us to this point. And uh, we are moving onwards and upwards, hopefully, to not only get um, first shots in, but start working at second doses as well coming up in the near future. So on that good news, I'm going to pass it over to Paul Johnson, our Emergency Operations Center Director, for some additional local news about issues of openings and closings and such. Paul Johnson. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, as you mentioned, we continue to be in that stay at home order uh, situation and we continue to enforce uh, around that. So I know that the weather's getting in to be in great shape and we are, you know, creeping towards what we uh, hope is the end of that stay at home order. But uh, while we're in it, uh, important to follow those rules, keep these numbers going down. They're going down, but uh, not in dramatic fashion. It's a slow and steady decline. Uh, we want to keep that acceleration moving, and that takes all of us to do our part. From an enforcement perspective, uh, there was lots of enforcement, uh, and it was a split, a lot of enforcement that was actually unrelated uh, to the, the COVID 19 regulations at all. Uh, lots of things happening around our falls areas. And I'll take this opportunity to put in a personal or a, a public service announcement about the fact that it is illegal to hike, hike up Albion Falls or Shadoke Falls at any time. Even when we are all able to declare this pandemic behind us, it will still be illegal to hike up Albion Falls and Shadoke Falls. We had a number of penalties um, applied over the last week in these areas and 
always as the weather gets better, our falls areas become uh, very big attractions, which is wonderful. However, they also become an area where people uh, uh, go off in where they shouldn't be and uh, uh, do things that they shouldn't. And again, some of this is related to the pandemic and our COVID regulations, but uh, much of it is just the same stuff that we would be enforcing pandemic or not. One of the areas, there's a little bit of confusion, I think, and just to be really clear, recreational boating is not permitted under the stay at home order, period. I know people say I can't understand if I want to go out and do some recreational boating. I just I don't get it. Uh, the reality is it is not allowed under the provincial regulations. Uh, there's lots of signage around our boat uh, ramp at uh, Bayfront. But we're seeing a lot of people, particularly as this weather now really starts to get nice. A lot of people um, uh, trying to put out their recreational boats and a lot of disrespectful behavior. Uh, but the bottom line is that this is not allowed uh, under the stay at home order and under the uh, the the orders that the province has put in place. So uh, please avoid uh, using your recreational boating. The piece that is allowed is is uh, you know for people to put their boats in, and and a lot of people at this time of year are putting their boats in, getting it into the dock. Can't use them right now, uh, but that is allowed. Obviously, uh, we don't want to force people to keep their uh, boats on on dry land, or if it needs to be serviced, you can get your boat in and out uh, for repairs or services, but not to be used for those recreational activities. And we continue to enforce around uh, illegal gatherings as well. And a number of those continue to happen in private residences, uh, people holding and uh, even small gatherings of birthday parties or indoor uh, gatherings where people are just getting together. The, remember, it is, not, uh, it is not allowed to have a gathering of any size indoors or out. Uh, you're to gather with uh, your household, those in your household, or if you are a single person, the household that you have exclusively uh, connected with for, from a socialization perspective. And also over the weekend, there were a couple of uh, protests. Uh, one uh, which has become a rather regular occurrence is uh, protests against some of the, uh, the orders that are in place provincially and locally around COVID-19. Uh, but also this, uh, this weekend, um, a number of people uh, who were uh, pro-Palestine uh, supporters, but gathering and a number of uh, of charges were laid and I understand that our police services alongside our bylaw folks continue to examine uh, the situation to see whether more charges will be laid. And while we recognize that uh, global events continue to happen, local events continue to happen and people want to have their voice heard. And uh, of course, as the city of Hamilton and you've heard the mayor say this, we're very supportive of that, but the rules are the rules. And right now there is to be no gathering for any purpose uh, indoors or outdoors, and, and we will enforce uh, regardless of the purpose for that. So all that's to say that uh, we continue to enforce and will continue to enforce uh, to whatever is in place uh, locally, but I have to tell you, it's also nice that we're having conversations uh, the same way we're all enthusiastic about the fact that all uh, adults now are eligible to book through the online tool and get their, their vaccine uh, booking in place. Uh, we're also really buoyed by the fact that uh, I believe it was today, the Minister of Health has said that they're continuing to examine whether outdoor activities may open prior to the end of the stay at home order. So we'll remain to be seen on that front. And we are getting ready to be not only in place so that all of our outdoor amenities are available for folks the minute that they can be available, uh, but also looking forward to activities in the summer as well. And uh, very buoyed by comments by the Premier that says that uh, he, like many people, including our local folks, want to make sure that uh, summer activities for children, summer camp activities are available, both the ones we operate as the city of Hamilton and many, many others in our community run by some great organizations that uh, last year were very much constrained, uh, took a very conservative approach last year. I think it was the right move last year, given how little we knew about the virus at the time and uh, obviously didn't have a vaccine strategy in place this summer little different approach. So we look forward to the actual guidelines that will come out to guide us in our work. We're excited to be ready for when that um, outdoor recreation activity ban is lifted and we can get our courts in place and we can get uh, golf courses open. And then the other piece is looking forward to how we can make sure as many kids and families can enjoy summer activities in this city as is possible. Lots of great things going on and we're going to try and do our very best to make sure they're all there. Dr. Richardson, over to you. Sorry about that, folks, couldn't get myself off mute. 
So thanks very much. You love the uh, themes of positivity as we open up to the 18 plus as of tomorrow and we start thinking about what the summer might hold for us as we go forward. We are though, of course, still um, going just past the peak of wave three. So I'm going to give you some numbers to start us off and then move on to talk about uh, vaccine and those sorts of things. So 19,418 cases today, up 91 from yesterday. Uh, including 1116 local screen positive variants. Um, of these, we now have, an, you know, by far the majority still confirmed as B117 variants, uh, as well 27 confirmed P1 or Brazil variant cases, 11 that have been confirmed as B1351 South Africa variants. And one confirmed uh, new one that we um, found out about over the weekend, a B1617, uh, which is the variant that was originally identified in India. And so that has been confirmed um, and posted to the dashboard. Actually, it was posted on Friday, um, but just did want to highlight that today. Locally, we're now sitting at just over 77.9% of our cases having a mutation or variant of concern over the last seven days. Uh, currently 962 active cases, so that is down from previously 374 deaths to date with no new tests, no new deaths today. We have a total of 38 local outbreaks on our website and one new outbreak reported today at the Hamilton Downtown Family YMCA men's residence. Our seven day moving average of cases is at 109 and the weekly instance is sitting at 133 cases per 100,000 people per week. So as always, you can find more on our dashboard, the interactive parts of it too, giving you access to additional analyses that you can take a look at. I do want to just take a moment though to talk about a uh, lab error that we had identified with our uh, percent positivity rate. And this was uh, due to the lab system counting multiple tests from the same specimen. So when it was tested and tested positive, and then if it was screened, when it was screened for the variants, if both of those things came back as positive, then it was counted ultimately as two tests instead of one. And so as we uh, discovered that had been going on since April, um, it resulted in an inflated percent positive, po percent positivity report and um, we have now corrected that. And we uh, going forward are going to be using the percent positivity value provided to us each week by the Institute of Clinical Evalu Evalu Evaluative Sciences or ISIS um, as uh, some of the other public health units have been doing. So this will result in a one to 2% change in positivity. And it's not a real change in percent positivity. Um, it is really because the two data sources calculated in slightly different ways, as I was saying. And so it will be refreshed on our dashboard Thursday this week and then every week on Wednesdays. From a vaccine standpoint, as um, we've been talking about today, we're actually up. I get new numbers uh, at the end of the morning. Um, so a little higher number than we had at Board of Health this morning. We're at 246,822 vaccines having it been administered and estimated 48.1% of the eligible population in Hamilton who have received a vaccine. So very, uh, you know, slowly moving towards that 50% mark, which we're very much uh, wanting to see as soon as possible. We continue to see that there is a stable and reliable vaccine supply locally and across the pr province, which is very positive. And um, as you heard from the mayor already today, that effective tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., everybody who is 18 years of age and older in 2021 are eligible to book an appointment to receive that COVID-19 vaccination. Now, if you're somebody who is 17 today and turning 18 later in the year, you just do need to look for those Pfizer clinics that will be noted on the, uh, the system to make sure that you uh, are getting the Pfizer vaccine. So anybody, all the adults who are um, in Hamilton and across the province can now book for a vaccine. You can book into any clinic that you would like to get into that is up there on the provincial system, whether it's here in Hamilton or elsewhere. And we encourage everybody to go online, look at that um, provincial booking tool that you can find on our website or through the province's website, or you can call the provincial call center at one 888 Nine 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 six four eight eight. Um, if you can, that takes the pressure off our local hotline, and they've been able to uh, to keep more of those calls as they've had less pressure as well. And it makes sure that for those who cannot 
book online that they uh, that they um, are able to go through our call center and that's the group that we are focusing on. With that, um, we continue to add more appointments to our portal. We will have seen some new ones have been going up this week and we'll be having more go up shortly as we go forward. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about the, the um, 12 to 17 year old strategy and we're certainly um, working with the province to create some appointments that are family friendly and so you'll hear about more of that uh, with our vaccine bookings as well. Our primary care partners, too, are working hard to increase vaccine accessibility, and they are holding clinics at the David Braley Health Sciences Centre, and you can book those through that provincial website as well. Um, with, uh, when it comes to kids that are, are 12 to 17, we're expecting the province will open up eligibility for that group the week of May 31st. Um, and we are working with our local school board partners to look at a plan to vaccinate those that are 12 to 17 years of age. So we'll be taking into consideration dis different aspects like Indigenous populations, um, not only our public schools, but also private schools, our urban and rural settings, students with special needs, um, students and families without uh, English as a first language, all the, the many different aspects, and developing, as I said, these family-friendly clinics that are great to bring the these kids that are 12 plus to, uh, but also for parents who are coming out and uh, potentially haven't gotten vaccinated because of some of the challenges of bringing your kids to a vaccine clinic with you. These hopefully will offer a very good opportunity for anybody who's coming forward to get themselves and their children that are 12 and up vaccinated. So those are planned to be held the weeks of June 14th and 21st, as well as for second doses, the weeks of August 9th and uh, to, to 16th. Um, so you'll hear more details about those and in the, the coming weeks. As well, in terms of another group that um, has had some changes lately, our healthcare uh, workers at highest risk. So those who work in the ICUs, those who work in the emerge departments on the COVID floors um, and various other settings are uh, have been moved up in terms of the time interval for their second dose. And it is now at the initial intervals of 21 to 28 days for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And our partners are working through how to reach out to everybody and rebook their second dose. And you should be hearing them from them sometime this week in terms of how that's going to be done to have those rebooked uh, very soon. Um, information about all of our vaccine clinic locations, the eligibility factors, all of that information is of course on our www.hamilton.ca slash vaccine booking webpage. And please do look there, figure it out. The information does continue to be um, complex when it comes to some of these factors, but also now that we're at the 18 plus, it does make it a lot easier in terms of knowing who is covered. Nonetheless, um, I do want to just uh, remind people, even when you're vaccinated, uh, because our case rates continue to be high, it is still very important to follow all of the public health measures, staying home uh, as much as possible, and especially if you're feeling unwell, making sure to go out and get a test if you have any symptoms that are compatible with COVID-19 or have been a close contact of somebody with COVID-19, continuing to limit gatherings to only those in your immediate household, physically distancing and wearing masks if you must be within six feet of somebody who's from outside your household. And one other piece about the whole vaccination program, this is absolutely something that um, is done by the whole Hamilton Healthcare um, Partners Group and as well those that are helping to advise us through the Vaccine Readiness Network as well as our vaccine ambassadors who have begun as of this weekend um, just so many people that are contributing to this and helping to make it happen. And it is just been fantastic to see the collaborative effort as we have gone forward. Um, just in terms, wanted to go back to the, the case experience and the outbreaks in the apartment complexes that had been declared over the last couple of weeks. So these sorts of outbreaks in a non-congregate setting, such as a private apartment building, have been uncommon for us throughout the pandemic. Um, we have, of course, been responding to these outbreaks at these three apartment buildings and done case and contact management investigations for anybody who has tested positive. We did arrange door-to-door -door testing through our EMS colleagues for anybody um, in those buildings to, in order to identify any cases, make sure people had access to testing. And as it stands at the moment at the village apartments, which are the 151 Queen North, 
Of the 60 total cases, currently 40 of those cases are active. At the 235 Rebecca Street building of the 110 cases that were identified there, currently 14 are active. And at the 125 Wellington Street um, apartment building, 42 cases were identified and currently 25 of those are active. Of course, we've been working uh, both to identify the factors involved in those outbreaks, working to make sure that infection prevention and control measures are in place in each of those buildings in terms of cleaning, um, postings about mask wearing, making sure laundry room uh, limits are set, those sorts of things. Uh, and of course, working with residents to access vaccines. So this weekend, there were 150 spots that were allocated at First Ontario Vaccine Clinic as a starting point to assess uptake with those at Rebecca Towers and 58 uh, residents attended the clinic during those times. Of course, they're free to book in at others and, and access uh, whichever clinic they would prefer. We did have on hand buses to help people to get back and forth. Um, to the clinic and back to home, and as well for those who were unable to leave the home and uh, needed to be vaccinated on the site, there were 28 residents who took up our EM, our primary care partners who provided that at the uh, at the site, and um, and got vaccinated. Going forward, we'll continue to offer designated spots if they are needed and continue to work with the building about uh, what they need in terms of uh, access to vaccination. And we're also working with the Village Apartments and the Wellington Place Apartments for similar plans uh, for the tenants. Again, we go through, we make sure we've offered testing first um, so people can be identified as to whether they're a case and shouldn't be going out or uh, contact and need to stay home in quarantine. And then all of those who can are, uh, they'll be arranged to go out to the First Ontario Centre, which fortunately is uh, quite close by. And uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, we're expecting that will be starting with the dates and times that are, are being organized to be finalized and communicated with the residents um, in terms of details over the coming day. Um, overall, of course, good news, positive things as uh, we're going forward. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, uh, Paul, and uh, to all of our residents out there. Uh, I know this has been uh, a continuing tough time, and hopefully the nicer weather is helping to lift everyone's spirits a bit. I know that uh, many people are actively working in their gardens and backyards and front yards and o occupying their time at, at a stay-at-home basis uh, as much as possible. But very, very important still, as the even though the nicer, nicer weather is in front of us. And... Um, uh, one of the most effective prevents, preventative tools for uh, all of us is some of the masking and physical separating, staying at home, but also getting the vaccine. Uh, so to uh, protect our loved ones and to, uh, to protect the health of our community and our families, uh, the vaccine uh, in, in and amongst the, uh, the, the public health measures is, you know, the, the most effective way that we're going to get back to some sense of normalcy, hopefully sooner rather than later. And as uh, Paula indicated we are preparing ourselves for uh, a summer with activity. Uh, hopefully the case numbers go down and we can uh, look forward to, uh, you know, more recreational opportunities happening in our, in our community and a, a more gradual opening that doesn't throw away all the work that we've done to, uh, to get us to this point. Uh, still, still bears in mind the cases that we're experiencing and the healthcare challenges that we're facing. And so I'm sure we're all anxious to get to a better place and that better place looks like it's on the horizon, but we need to continue to be vigilant in the work that we're doing to prevent the spread of this disease. Uh, it is vital that we all uh, follow those public health orders. And the, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jasmine who will uh, take us to questions of the media for, for, uh, for Dr. Elizabeth or Paul or myself. Jasmine. Great. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have eight media joining us today. As usual, we'll start with one question and one follow-up for everybody. First question will go to Lisa Paleski from CHML. Lisa, you can go ahead. Thanks very much for taking my question. Um, so this is uh, about the vaccination opening up to anyone 18 and older tomorrow. It's obviously you know, good news on the fact that more people are eligible, but it's also going to make it more challenging for people who have been in potentially vulnerable settings uh, who have been trying to get an appointment but haven't been able to get one until now for whatever reason. Um, you know, the people in the high rises with outbreaks or even those in 
the postal codes that are not actually hotspots. Uh, is there anything the city can do to make it easier for those who are vulnerable, but you know, now that eligibility is opening up to everyone, they might be kind of pushed back to the back of the line. Jazz, I think I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, thanks, Lisa. In terms of the um, the these, this challenge that we have about making sure that we have the the opening up for all the people who are eligible and can come to those clinics, those mass vaccination clinics are very important to go through that route. At the same time, as you say, those who are more vulnerable, we need to work with them, make sure that there are vaccine clinics that are are closer to where. Um, they are living and so things like the pharmacy clinics that have been opened up in those hotspot areas and will continue to get opened yeah. up across uh, the city, but also some special clinics we're doing like the one at Restoration House or some special uh, slots that are available through our phone line. Those sorts of things have, uh, have helped to make it more uh, um, accessible for people to uh, access vaccination as we go forward. We're hopeful, you know, some of the things we've heard as we've been out doing this work over the last uh, few days as well is just about how people have a lot of questions about their own particular context. What does it mean from them in terms of their own medical history and health history? Um, and so these are things that are very well addressed through working with their primary care providers. And so as that primary care channel continues to open up, we're, uh, we're hopeful that's going to be a very important route for people as well. So we'll be working, our vaccine ambassadors will be working, getting out to people, uh, making sure that they're aware of answering their questions, looking at ways to get access to the vaccine as we go forward. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, my follow up is actually for Paul. Uh, this is for a colleague who's covering the more uh, practical side of things. Just wondering about the details of the boating ban, um, whether that includes things like kayaks and paddle boards. So we've taken the approach in, in Hamilton that uh, those are sort of recreational uh, pieces. So paddle boarding and uh, people other than kayaks is, uh, is not recreational boating. Uh, we're talking about people getting out and fishing or people wanting to take their pleasure craft out and, uh, and have some recreational I work on there, but if you're out there for uh, what is uh, recreation and exercise, uh, using your paddleboard or what have you, then uh, those are those are acceptable. Great, thank you, Paul. Next question is to Lisa Hefner from CHCH. Lisa, you can go ahead. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Dr. Richardson. My uh, question is sort of similar to Lisa Bleski, I think, in that when we open up the vaccinations to people 18 plus, they're I don't know if you know how many more people are going to be eligible, but how does that jive with the amount of supply that Hamilton has? So when people sign up to tomorrow, become eligible, when can they expect to actually get a vaccine appointment? Are you booking like into late June, July? How is that? How, what, do, what can people expect? Thanks, Lisa. So as we go forward right now, we do have appointments up there that go through the end of May, and we still do have some openings available through there. Um, and then we'll be opening up more appointments as we go into June. We are uh, working with the province and reserving some of those times for the weeks of the 14th and the 21st to be those family friendly clinics so that our uh, kids can get in and we can have these um, more tailored clinics as we go forward and then looking to open up further. So at this point, we're still booking in May and uh, we'll be adding more appointments as we go forward into June. Certainly that's an important point as people um, gain access to uh, the, become eligible for the vaccine is the piece that you could, they're now eligible to book, but the actual appointment is still going to likely take a couple of weeks or more in terms of getting the actual vaccine. And as a follow-up, Dr. Richardson, can you describe those family-friendly clinics a little bit more, what they might look like? Are they pop-up clinics? Are they in schools? What do you mean they're family-friendly? And, um, and how will that roll out? Hi, thanks, Lisa. That's all the kind of work that we're working on right now with our school board partners. We're doing that planning about what is it that would make sense? We know for sure when it comes to um, kids who have special needs that they're an example of a clinic that needs to be very much focused and able to work with um, those populations and the supports that they need as they go through, but for all kids and all families looking at what, uh, what is needed. So you'll hear more from us about that over the coming weeks. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question will be to Phil Perkins from CHCH. Phil, you can go ahead. Hi there. So Premier Ford kind of surprised a lot of people in the camp industry that camps are good to go uh, for July, even though some have 
look to cancel overnight already. But uh, today, Kristen Elliott said that it's going to be up to the operator uh, to determine whether vaccination vaccinated staff are the ones that are going to they're going to be hiring and whether it's going to be up to the camp for for campers to be vaccinated or not. Um, it, I know Hamilton runs a lot of camps. Are, are they expected to have staff and campers be vaccinated in order to, to take part? So, you know, we don't have some of these guidelines out. I understand that uh, they're leaving it up to, to local areas, but I know that there'll be some uh, guidelines that will come out in general, which will help, uh, um, you know, from the camps that uh, we run at the city. I mean, let's be realistic here for some of the kids that are coming to camp, there is no vaccine available. So if you're under 12 years old, there's no vaccine available. And if you're at 12 to 17 18, however you want to define it, role, you know, you're not going to be fully vaccinated before summer camps would be over. So I, I think that, you know, the, the chances of it being that only vaccinated children and, and uh, there is no sector of our workforce that is uh, demanding that all staff be vaccinated, including some places like healthcare and long-term care. So I, I think we have to be realistic, uh, Phil, about uh, what's, what's likely to happen. Uh, and I think it's going to be those public health measures in place and uh, all of the safety protocols uh, that, doesn't mean for a second we're suggesting delay on vac vaccination. Get your vaccine as quick as you can, uh, and that will help out as well. But in in terms of that sweeping, you know, no child who's unvaccinated will be able to attend camp. I just don't see how that's realistic, and uh, um, so I I, I don't want to worry parents. Uh, sign up for camp. Let's see what those safety protocols look like. We'll be doing some investigation as we gear up towards. Uh, the opening of camps uh, that the city run in, in July. And I know that our partner organizations that uh, deliver a lot of camps will be doing so as well. And, and I'm speaking, you know, from the standpoint of a day camp program, which is what the city runs uh, for the most part, there will be additional layers of safety that uh, overnight camps would need to, to look at if they're going to successfully operate. Um, but, you know, there's lots of ways we can do these things well. You think about child care, it's happened throughout this pandemic, and we've uh, managed to provide care to children on a regular basis. Schools have been open at various points along the way. So I think we can make this work. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to, you know, have parents be fearful that uh, there's going to be a, a vaccination or no camp um, uh, policy at the city. We haven't discussed that at the moment. I, I can't see that being a, a regulation that would come down as well. All right, that's it. No follow up. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Next question will be to Kate McCullough from the Hamilton Spectator. Kate, you can go ahead. Hi all, and thanks very much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Richardson, this is somewhat in line with, uh, with Lisa's question, but can you elaborate um, a bit more on the role of the Hamilton, of Hamilton school boards um, in the vaccination rollout for the 12 to 17 age group? What, what, what role are they playing in this? Thanks, Kate. So as we go forward, those are the, uh, they're certainly our partners in this and looking at how to best serve the 12 to 17 year olds and what opportunities there might be. And uh, we'll continue to explore that. We're very much in the throes of planning at the moment and exactly what we're going to do is what's uh, going to be decided over the coming week or so. Thanks very much. Um, and as a follow-up also for you, Dr. Richardson, um, the Board of Health heard this morning that the goal is to um, have kids in that age group get their first shot in June and a second dose by, I think the date was August 22nd. Um, what, what then is the plan for educators? Are they following the same timeline in terms of uh, a second dose? And, and if so, um, what's public health doing to make sure that that um, happens? Yeah, thanks, Kate. As we've gone through, we'll know that teachers were actually part of those first groups that were opened up to as essential workers. So they've had access to booking through the uh, the provincial system now for a number of weeks as we've uh, as we've rolled this out. And at that uh, that uptake, we hope, is going on very much so. There are also daycare workers who are eligible to get vaccinated as well. And we saw first licensed daycare and now unlicensed daycare being eligible to vaccinate. So they have been opened up already. So certainly, you know, as much as possible, hope people are getting in, getting booked. We certainly have vaccination appointments open for people. And then if there are other opportunities where they'd like to come to some of these clinics, that that works for them. Because, of course, there are also individuals who have families and have those uh, sorts of, um, uh, of needs as well, that these will provide really good opportunities for them to be vaccinated too. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question is to Joanna from the Hamilton Spectator. Joanna, you can go ahead. 
Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, my first question is about the summer, and I think it would be Dr. Richardson. Um, we keep hearing that the summer hopefully will be more open and that things will be a bit more back to normal, but the forecasting that we have shows that uh, Hamilton's numbers will be in like gray lockdown red zone until like at least the end of June. So those things seem to be a bit at odds. Can, can you talk a bit about you know, what, what we can expect or what any of that means? Thanks, Joanna. And, it, you know, so well said in terms of the challenges we've got with the, the case numbers coming down slowly, that some of this opening up does lead to other opportunities for spread. And so, um, you know, these sorts of activities right now are ones that uh, we're most uh, focused on to trying to limit and it's part of that stay at home order to bring things down. That said, we do know that being outdoors is something that is a lower risk activity. We do uh, still need people to be staying apart, that six feet apart, needing people to wear masks if they're going to be inside that, that sort of range. So as we move forward, as the province looks at this and what is possible, what's doable, what's the lowest risk activities, what can we do? I think that's very much gonna be our focus as we, as we go forward. Vaccination is the other key element here. And so we know that we're you know, currently here in Hamilton sitting at 48% of people who are vaccinated we are trying to get that number up with every dose that we can get into arms and drive down the, the rates of cases that we have. So we'll see uh, that continued effort to continue to push forward. So I think it's too early to know the specifics. Certainly no people are trying to work out what that might, might mean. Some more information on that soon. Thanks so much. And uh, my second question is uh, also, I think, to Dr. Richardson. Um, we heard today a bit about uh, at Board of Health about the vaccine ambassadors starting. Can you talk a bit about why it has taken so long to get that program going? Because we're a lot of months into this now. So why is it? Why are they just getting started now? Thanks, Joanna. And so, so there's a couple of different things about the the vaccine ambassador piece, and if you will, we've been working with the number of organizations you heard about, uh, many of them today on the Board of Health, who we have been um, working with to be ambassadors around the vaccine and working with our staff as well to talk about the vaccine. We've been going out and doing um, information sessions, live ones, pre-recorded ones, um, talking to various groups and asking others as well. Of course, they have many. We know that the, the leaders in these communities, that uh, their healthcare providers in these communities are very much the trusted groups that they want to hear from, that they need information from. As well, we didn't have an ambassador program such as this before um, this came up. And so as we talked about it, looked at what was working elsewhere, this was something we pursued. And unfortunately, it does take some time to hire people on. And you want to make sure that you've got the best people for the job, that they can speak the languages that are relevant uh, to these communities, that they have uh, the ability to connect in these areas. And so they have now come on board and are cut the the first ones are on board, more are coming over this week as well, and uh, and then can go out and work in these communities to continue to look at how we can give people the information, understand what the issues are, and increase the rates of uh, trans uh, vaccination, I should say, in these communities. Great. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Our next question will be to Maria from the Hamilton Spectator. Maria, you can go ahead. Hi, sorry, it took me a second. Uh, thank you so much for taking my questions. And mine are also both for Dr. Richardson. Um, my first question is about um, just in terms of the announcement that tomorrow 18 plus, uh, regardless of postal code, will be eligible. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to how the city is coping with the demand for vaccines as more people become eligible. And, you know, you touched on appointments being booked up um, until the end of May. And I'm wondering if you can. Um, comment on whether that's solely due to supply or if there are other constraints such as space limitations or staffing and uh, whether the city does have enough staff to administer the new shipments that are coming up. Sorry, Maria, I missed the last line there. If we have enough. Oh, staff, staff. Oh, staff. Right, in terms of getting this out. Well, I guess the, the long and short of it is that, that health human resources are short in every aspect of, of our programming. We know that it's been very, very tight. 
um, for our colleagues who are working in the hospitals, on the wards and emergency departments and the ICUs. It's been very tight as well for all that are contributing to the vaccination effort. Um, it's been tight as we've been going through long-term care and retirement homes and all of the resources that support all of these efforts are in short supply and high demand. And so um, everybody has been encouraged to come out, work um, in these settings, and, and so many people have stepped up and stepped forward to do just that. Um, that said, we do have, um, you know, a number of different venues that we are working through. Our large sites are the ones that uh, do have the highest throughput in terms of getting the most vaccine out into arms, but we know that those aren't the right uh, solutions for everyone. So we do look at setting up mobile clinics in many different scenarios to support people. Of course, we can't set up a mobile net, uh, clinic in every neighborhood. We can't set up um, one in every building in Hamilton, but uh, the good news is that the pharmacy channel is getting opened right back up again with Moderna and Pfizer and is expected to expand very quickly so that there are this vaccine in every pharmacy in our community. Our primary care partners, as we learn to work with these vaccines more so, are also um, getting greater access to vaccine and so it will get out to more and more people. And that's what we need to do. We're at that stage in the vaccination strategy where we're looking to transition to these sustainable, accessible ways for people to, to reach uh, vaccines from their most trusted providers. And so that's very good news that we're moving that way with pharmacies and primary care as well. Thank you very much. And I'm wondering if you can um, also um, comment on with these greater shipments of doses expected um, soon, does Hamilton have a timeline for when it expects to open the Rosedale Arena? Thanks, Maria. So the Rosedale piece was something we had looked at when the idea was we may be up to 10,000 vaccines being provided per day. But um, as we looked at supply and as things came forward, we never got to a threshold where we weren't able to handle that uh, and get that vaccine out through our existing three large mass clinics and then the number of different mobile um, sites that we have. So it was put on hold indefinitely. And at this point, rather than uh, opening Rosedale, it still looks like it's going to be going out through those other providers, primary care, pharmacies, in terms of reaching other parts of our community rather than opening up Rosedale. Next question will be to Christine Rankin from CBC Hamilton. Christine, you can go ahead. Great. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, this one is for Paul Johnson. And so this morning at the Board of Health and then a little bit in this briefing, you mentioned wanting things to be less conservative this summer uh, in terms of reopening and offering more programs that you can. And so I'm wondering what considerations or, or moves the city is making for businesses who are also hoping to run under a less restrictive summer. So clearly, when it comes to retail and, and businesses, much of that's going to be driven by uh, the, the provincial direction. And, uh, you know, I think what you've seen from the city all the way along, and the mayor's been a real leader in this, in terms of bringing together people to think about all of the ways that we can encourage business to do things in safe ways, our, our patio program which as we know, we got caught in a little bit of that time frame where things opened up a little bit. And then of course they shut down very quickly, but we actually had an emergency meeting uh, and then we, we approved and got things moving even a week faster than we thought we were going to. Uh, I know it all came for naught, but those are the types of things we think about is what can we do that will really encourage uh, businesses to take advantage of whatever safe ability to open up uh, uh, looks like. And we've done it in the past with uh, um, you know, with some of the parking regulations, uh, you know, I don't think we'll need to change those because uh, I think the next stage will be getting retail back to that in person. But I remember way back in the beginning stages of this, we cleared the way so that pickup could happen more easily everywhere. So those are examples of ways that we think about how to support business. Uh, and I know that uh, really what business want is just to open up and open back up. And, and I, I know that that will come as, uh, as we can. So we'll be ready. Uh, we'll have some of those programs in place. And I know that the uh, team that uh, the mayor assembled, uh, both from an economic development perspective internally at the city, but with a number of our partners, they continue to action the types of things that will help businesses to thrive as we move forward. 
uh, as well, because reopening is one part of it, of the equation, but the other piece of the equation is how do we help businesses to get back on a stable footing? How do we help them to continue to do the innovation that they've been looking at? How do we continue to bring more people back to work? There's been a lot of people that have been laid off. So uh, those are the kinds of things that, uh, that we'll be looking at. And I just wondered, Mr. Mayor, if you wanted to just touch on the, the work of that team, because I think a lot of what set Hamilton up is the ability to have that task force that, uh, uh, that you pulled together. I know it was uh, chaired by, uh, by community members as well, but really a great group that helped give us a blueprint for what we could do from a reopening perspective. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And <clears throat> certainly the uh, the task force uh, made a number of recommendations to uh, to help uh, businesses open up when 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 possible. So uh, there were some planning issues that came out of that that helped uh, the development on the development side. Uh, there's certainly some uh, some patio issues and restaurant issues that we uh, advanced. Uh, we we actually gave more money to BIAs to be either ready or or be able to invest more in uh, promoting and advertising their. Uh, their businesses and their in their local BIAs, uh, we provided resources to uh, to continue to help develop uh, the online uh, sales in, in our community that uh, currently is helping individuals uh, in our community right now. So, much more to do, uh, and certainly economic recovery is not going to be a a few months in the making, but certainly some immediate uh, assistance uh, is available that will help uh, hopefully kickstart when we're able. To, uh, to get more businesses uh, up and running and, and moving forward again. So we're really grateful for the great work that was done. And many of those actions uh, have been adopted uh, and are yet to be enacted as a result of the shutdown, but uh, certainly ready to go again once the, uh, when the, once the go ahead is available. And the last thing I'll add, Christine, is that uh, we've had throughout the pandemic a great working relationship with the Chamber of Commerce around how to encourage businesses to be ready for whatever those modifications look like. And so they've sat at the table with public health and there's been a real collaboration in terms of, so what does it mean? We know that business isn't going to open up fully day one. Uh, that's not what's going to happen in the next number of weeks. Uh, there will be restrictions in place. And so having that ability for the chamber to work with public health and to be very clear and concise with businesses about here's what you need to do to remain safe, keep your employees safe, keep the public safe. I think all of those things help business. And, you know, some people may say, well, now we want incentives for this or incentives for that. But I really do believe when you can have clear communication so that businesses understand how they can operate, that's as useful as having some of these other things in place. Because if you're guessing what the rules are and you're not clear on how to make it happen, then you're going to waste valuable time that you could be putting into your business trying to figure it out. So we've really worked closely together with uh, our business community throughout this. And, and I think it, uh, it will help us uh, to be in great stead when, uh, when we can finally see a bit more of that uh, reopening happen. Thanks for your answers on, uh, on that one. And my, my follow-up is also for you, Paul Johnson. Um, I'm wondering what numbers you have on the bylaw infractions you mentioned uh, that happened over the weekend in terms of waterfalls and social gatherings. So sure, uh, in terms of park penalties over the last week, uh, there were 58, the majority of those non-COVID-19 related. It's just uh, people that are uh, doing things in the falls, particularly should Oak Falls and Albion Falls. We did have two people that uh, were issued a penalty for golfing at should Oak Golf Course and uh, one for consuming alcohol in, the, in a park. So, um, uh, you know, some things related to the pandemic, but many of them in terms of our parks uh, related to um, uh, just the, the stuff that, as I say, you, you can't do now and you won't be able to do years from now either. Uh, in terms of, um, of our... our um, other penalties, uh, we issued a number from uh, some of the protests. So there were 14 issued at City Hall for, uh, for some of the protests that were happening. And I mentioned there were two protests there. So some of those were there. And then five were issued at residential properties for parties. So uh, there were a total overall of 29 penalties. Uh, and then a few others here for the physical distancing or face coverings. I don't have a lot of details on that. But uh, the big ones in terms of uh, some of the other pandemic-related uh, penalties were to do with the protests that were happening uh, over the weekend. And then, as I say, a few for those uh, continued indoor or outdoor gatherings uh, the, where households are gathering with, uh, with friends or other households uh, outside their immediate household. But uh, that's a sense of the numbers. And some of the ones obviously have been updated on our website that apply to businesses, but that gives you a little bit of a flavor of the individual ones we've had over the last week as well. 
Great, thank you, Paul. Next question will be to Manisa from CHCH. You can go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question. My question is actually for Dr. Uh, Richardson. Um, regarding the 28 residents that were, tenants that were vaccinated at Rebecca Towers yesterday, what, made, what factors made them qualify uh, for on-site vaccines? Thanks uh, very much. So these were, were groups uh, or people that had worked with the group on site, the, the Rebecca Towers uh, Tenant Association, as well as our vaccine ambassadors. So they, they would have been people who, um, you know, were isolated or were in quarantine, they were either cases or contacts or other factors that, uh, that may have contributed to that need to be vaccinated on site. So I don't have specifics on on exactly who or what, but those were the sorts of factors that were being looked at and worked through. Thank you. And um, in terms of, uh, is it still ongoing? Like, is it just on the uh, on the weekends that they're the on-site vaccine clinics are going to be there, or are they still there now? No. So there's a, a, a whole piece that went on over the weekend in terms of getting uh, people into the vaccination clinics. And so some people had already been vaccinated. Some people chose to get vaccinated and had already booked in on their on their own um, through the, the mass vaccination clinics about another um 50 people took up the uh, the transportation to the clinics on site at First Ontario Centre. And then we did have those 28 people who were vaccinated on site um, through that group. So we'll continue to work with them just to look at ways to access vaccination. But they're, from uh, the standpoint of the homebound, we would expect going through with this group in terms of people who are, who are homebound that we would have picked up those individuals at this point. And if anybody, uh, just as has happened with others, if anybody is continuing to be homebound in terms of a Lynn patient or a primary care patient, then there's, a, there's still that route to get access through that, that way. But Otherwise, we'll be continuing to look at how people can come to the vaccination clinics to get vaccinated. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Mr. Mayor, that's the end of our media questions for today. So I will pass things back to you. Well, thank you, Jasmine. And uh, I want to thank uh, Bill Cusper, Custers and the entire team at Cable 14 and Clear Cable. And again, thank you to uh, the media partners who uh, continue to share this information in our broader community. It's important that this information gets shared in our community, it's very, very helpful. And please do your part and stay home while we are under the stay at home order. Connect with your loved ones virtually on video chat or over the phone. And please check on your neighbors, especially elderly neighbors to make sure they're doing okay and have everything they need. Uh, shop local as much as you can. Uh, hometownhub.ca uh, provides uh, online resources for shopping local uh, in our community in partnership with uh, economic development and our chambers of commerce. And so uh, dial into the hometown.ca uh, website and you can look for a list of uh, local businesses that are continuing to operate on a, an online basis. And as always, ask for more information on COVID-19, for financial supports and any updates, visit our website at hamilton.ca slash coronavirus. So please continue to follow all the public health measures. They work, they help stop the spread of the virus. And uh, due to the long weekend coming up, we'll see you at our next meeting on Tuesday, May the 25th at 4 p.m. In the meantime, have a safe, uh, long Victoria Day weekend. Uh, stay within your own household, as difficult as that might be. It is really the right thing to do right now. Cases are not low, uh, but we want to get them lower. And so every step you take to help us get there is going to be uh, very, very helpful to get us back to some sort of new normal. So thank you all very much for tuning in and see you next Tuesday, May 25th at 4 p.m. Thank you.